All right. This is the last sermon in the Leviticus sermon series. Today we're going to be looking at the seven ritual feasts found in Leviticus 23. So I want to begin by talking about the importance of ritual. Um, As many of you know, our church has a thematic goal for this year, 2018, called Discipling Youth. And one of the goals under this theme of Discipling Youth is that we want to equip ourselves um, on how to encourage faith in our youth. So the resource that we chose to use through this year is called Sticky Faith. Uh, The council's reading it, all the staff, we're all reading it. In fact, this coming Saturday is a seminar for all of you to to come and attend. I encourage you to do that. And the book teaches us how to create sticky faith in our youth, how to create faith that sticks. And chapter 3 of this book talks about the importance of sticky identity, that your child is a beloved child of God. And how do you... How do you make that truth stick in their lives? And, uh, you know, how do we as parents and, um, you know, teachers, how do we teach our children that their core identity is a beloved child of God? It's very difficult to do in a society that that doesn't teach that, essentially. The messages that our kids get aren't, generally speaking, you know, you are a beloved child of God. Often... All of us, actually, but especially our kids included, root our identity in uh, what we have, what we do, or what other people say about us. And so that message of being a beloved child isn't always there. We need help to reinforce our child's identity as a beloved child of God. And the book encourages us to use rituals, to use rituals to reinforce uh, their identity as a child of uh, beloved child of God. By the way, when they talk about rituals, they're not talking about Gregorian chants and candlelight. They're, they're talking about social customs, uh, n- everyday normal practices that can be traditions. So they describe some healthy rituals that, that can include daily activities, but also yearly celebrations. By the way, I just want a true confession. I so wish I had read this book when my boys were little or before they were even born. I would definitely have parented differently. It is an incredible resource. You know, a couple of the examples that that they give for the rituals of daily activity, they encourage tucking your kid in at night and praying for them and thanking God that you have been given the gift of loving God's beloved child and that you're, you've been given the gift to know them and love them. Uh, the book encourages yearly celebrations, making a big deal out of their birthday, decorating, making sure their favorite food is there, d- doing their favorite cake. And after the, the birthday meal, they encourage you, everyone around, to say a word of thanksgiving and then to follow it up with a specific blessing about how that child fits in the family and their character. I mean, there's so many wonderful examples of things that we can do to help root our child in the truth that they're God's beloved child. Um, by the way, it's not too late to read this book and, you know, and start even if your kids are already grown. The point of these rituals, again, is to reinforce their identity, who they are as God's beloved child. Today, we're going to look at seven ritual feasts that God, our Heavenly Father, gives His children, Israel, and these seven feasts were commanded by God, and the seven feasts help reinforce that, that they are God's beloved children and they belong to His family. It's so beautiful. So today, we're going to do a couple things. First, We're going to look at all seven ritual feasts and how all seven of them point to a greater fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So that's what I'm going to do. Look at all seven feasts and how they point to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to do my best to apply this to our lives as well. So let's pray as we come to this time. Lord, thank you for um, 
calling us to be a holy nation, calling us to be holy, to be set apart. And Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is here with us right now. Would you fill us with your spirit to hear uh, your word, to, to see these seven feasts, to see how they point to Jesus? And may, may it change our lives, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we've been looking at highlights in the book of Leviticus. And the, the, the key verse in Leviticus is Leviticus 8.44, or 11.44. God says to Israel, his family, his children, make yourselves holy uh, and be holy for I am holy. The word holy simply means to be set apart, to be different, to be unique. And the, the book of Leviticus fundamentally answers this one question. How can we make ourselves holy? How do we do it? And God helps Israel to become holy. And this book is so beautifully written. So at the beginning we saw that God gives them these ritual sacrifices that help them draw near into his presence by saying, thank you and I'm sorry. Then we see how he ordains the priests, that we are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, set apart, called to serve God and to serve his people. Then we saw that God calls them into ritual cleanliness because God is the God of life. And so he doesn't want them to come in with symbols of death on them in his presence because he is life. And then the center of the book is the day of atonement when God forgives them of their sins once a year. Then we saw that God calls them into moral cleanliness. He calls them to love their neighbor. Then we see that God calls the priest to live and uh, have a higher moral standard than the rest of the nations and the rest of the cultures around them. And then today, it's the last sermon, we're going to take a look at the seven ritual feasts. God calls his children to these ritual feasts that reinforce their identity as his children and as, as being a part of his family. So, you ready to look at these feasts? I'm excited about it. Okay, so the seven ritual feasts, by the way, they are rooted in the three annual feasts that related to the times of harvest. So God in Exodus commanded them to celebrate these festivals. The Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrated the barley harvest. The Feast of Harvest or Weeks celebrated the wheat harvest. And then the Feast of Ingathering or Tabernacles celebrated the fruit harvest. So these three harvests were connected to their agricultural year. So it would be hard to miss the wheat harvest. So these concrete things help remind them about these festivals. So all seven of these festivals are related around these three main gatherings. So let's take a look at the seven feasts one at a time. By the way, I might give you a lot of scripture, and so you can just keep count on your fingers where we are. We're going to look at seven of them. You ready? Number one, the Passover. God says, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy. Remember holy just means set apart. So he wants them to take time to celebrate, kind of like birthdays and anniversaries. He wants them to take time to celebrate. It's holy. It's different. Only they do it. It sets them apart from all other nations. This holy gathering, this holy convocation, which you shall proclaim at the time um, appointed for each of them. And so in the first month, and the reason it's the first month, this is March, April, is because it's the month that they came out of Egypt and became a holy nation, right? So the first month of the 14th day on, of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Now, what is the Lord's Passover? I spent a whole sermon looking about this, but in short, the Passover feast was a meal that helped them rem- that they celebrated every year it helped them remember how god brought them out of slavery in egypt so if you remember the story that there were the 10 plagues as god was bringing them out the 10th plague was the plague on the firstborn so all the firstborn in egypt would die but god delivered israel's firstborn from death and how did he do it he said sacrifice a lamb 
paint the blood of the lamb on the door frames, which symbolizes the whole house, and then the death, the death would pass over that home. So God delivered them. God saved them from death. So um, he, he, the reason that they celebrate this feast is to remember God saved them and delivered them and brought them out of Egypt. Now, the, feast, the Passover feast points to a greater fulfillment. It points to Jesus Christ. It's why Jesus, on, when he celebrated the Passover feast, he took the cup and he says, this is, the blood, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So he connects his death with the Passover feast. And it's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So they would sacrifice a a Passover lamb once a year. And on on the day when they selected the Passover lamb, that's when Jesus entered Jerusalem. On the day when they sacrificed the Passover lamb once a year, on Friday, that's when Jesus was crucified on the cross. Jesus becomes our sacrificial lamb whose death saves us, just like the Passover lamb, the Exodus story, from, from death. And we have the gift of eternal life. So this feast we see points to a greater reality in Jesus Christ. That's feast one. You ready for feast two? The feast of unleavened bread. Happens just the day later. Begins the day later. So in Leviticus 23, it says, On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat only only unleavened bread bread. It's, it's a, again, a holy gathering. They didn't do any work for seven days. So what, what are they going to do on the Feast of Unleavened Bread? They're not going to eat leaven. Leaven couldn't even be in their homes. That's why we get the whole concept of spring clean, cleaning comes from here, because they had to clean out all their homes from all the leaven. Now, why did they, why did they celebrate this feast? Because they were to remember, once again, that they had to leave Egypt quickly. And so they, had, they, they didn't have time to let that bread rise, so they had to leave quickly in haste. So it was a time of remembering when God, once again, delivers them out of Egypt. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread also points to the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul works with this in 1 Corinthians 5 when he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Just a little bit of yeast. You only need a little bit, and it spreads and it infects. Cleanse out the old leaven, that's what they did during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate this festival, this festival, Feast of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. Beautiful. During the Passover feast, Jesus takes what we call communion bread, and it's actually unleavened bread, and he breaks it in half. It's called the bread of affliction. And that's when he says, this is my body uh, given for you, broken for you. Jesus becomes our unleavened bread. The feast, again, points to them being delivered out of slavery. And now Jesus, our unleavened bread, brings us out of the slavery of sin itself. It's just so beautiful. Okay, the third feast, the Feast of First Fruits. Leviticus 23 says, When you come into the land, I will give you and reap its harvest. And he's talking about the barley harvest here. You shall bring the bundle of the first fruits of the harvest of the priests, and you shall wave it. You know how we wave our hands in praise to the Lord? That, that's what he's doing here with these barley sheaves. Is he's he's going to wave it before the Lord, saying, "Thank you, God, so that you may be accepted." Now, this word means to have God's blessing, to have God's favor, and so it's a it's a feast to remember that you have God's favor. You are God's delight, His treasured possession, His blessing. Isn't that beautiful? Later uh, in Deuteronomy, they're going to have a, a, a specific 
uh, story to tell about their deliverance uh, when they bring these, um, these sheep. So, how do they celebrate this feast? They celebrate it as a, in a, as a time of worship to God for their deliverance, for the provision that he brings, and it was a time of rejoicing. And the Feast of First Fruits also, like all the other feasts, point to a greater reality. They point to Jesus Christ. This is what we read in 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. For as by a man Adam came death, by a man Jesus has come also the resurrection of the dead. So this first fruit feast points to Easter, points to Jesus' resurrection. It's beautiful. The fourth feast is the Feast of Weeks, or what we call Pentecost, or the Feast of Harvest. Leviticus 23 says, You, sh- you shall count uh, seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you, were brought, that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days. That's, the word Pentecost means 50. 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So seven weeks of seven. So they bring, uh, they were to bring, uh, you shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread. And in this case, they were leavened bread. And they were to be waved and, um, as they shall be baked with leaven as the first fruits. Now this is the the gathering of the wheat harvest. And so they bring these, these the, the first, they give God the best, the first fruits to God, and they wave them as an act of worship. So what is the Feast of Weeks? It's brought, they brought the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And they celebrated the Feast of Weeks for three main reasons. One, as I already mentioned, to celebrate the, the wheat harvest, thank God for his provision. Um, Two, to remember how they were slaves in Egypt. God brought them out. But the third reason they celebrated the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, was they celebrated the same month when God came down on Mount Sinai and gave them what? The Ten Commandments, the law. So, this Feast of Weeks points to the good news of Jesus Christ. How? Acts chapter 2 says this. When the day of Pentecost, that's the Feast of Weeks, arrived, they're all together in a place. And what happened? God, God, through tongues of fire and the sound of wind, comes down, descends upon them. And they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? This feast itself finds its ultimate fulfillment. On the day of Pentecost and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, when God writes his law on our hearts through his spirit. All right, feast number five. Are you with me? Feast number five. The Feast of Trumpets. Trumpets played a a very important role in the life of ancient Israel. They were blown for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons was they were blown to gather people and to send them out. So God himself says, make two Thank you, whoever did that. Was that Charlie? That has to be Pastor Charlie. That is hilarious. Thank you, whoever did that. I don't know. Maybe it's Rizal. Ah, it's Charlie. I see him up there. That is hilarious. Thank you, Pastor Charlie. That was unplanned, by the way. Oh, my. He's showing off his shofar. He has a shofar, right? Such ancient roots. Actually, the, the horn goes back to the sacrifice of Isaac when he was saved by the, the, the ram's horn. And so that's what he blew up there. Anyway, um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking to two silver trumpets. But um, um, it, they, they blew the trumpets. I mean, I, I would love to, to be there on, on that feast. 
So one of the reasons, again, was to summon the congregation together. Another was to send them out. Now, another reason that they blew trumpets was as an alarm for war. So when you go out to war in your land against your adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. It's it's an alarm. And we see this language all throughout the prophets. Jesus uses it um, in Joel 2 talking about the coming day of the Lord's judgment, blow the trumpet in science. Sound the alarm on your holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming near. So the coming day of the Lord is talking about a time of war. And that's why that that alarm was sounded. So what is the Feast of Trumpets? It's a solemn day. They shall observe this day on the seventh month, very important number. It's a solemn day of rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets. And again, it's holy. It's, a, it's set apart. It's a set apart day. Apparently, they, they blew trumpets a hundred times on one day. And could you imagine being there in the midst of this? I would love that. Why do they celebrate? They, they blew the trumpets, remember, to gather all of God's people. And so all, they would all come and gather. And it was a day of solemn rest to prepare their hearts for the coming day of judgment. And that's why the Feast of Trumpets ultimately points to Jesus Christ. Paul connects trumpets with the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last what? For the what? It's a trumpet, of course, will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet, which is the very voice of God. Remember, the trumpet was what grew louder and louder on Mount Sinai. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, Now we come to the sixth feast, the Day of Atonement. I I preached a whole sermon on this, but I'm going to highlight this quickly for maybe those who are are guests or who weren't here. Leviticus 23. Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time again, holy, set apart, set apart, a gathering. For it is the Day of Atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. So what is the Day of Atonement? Once a year the high priest would take two goats as sin offerings. One goat he would offer as a sin sacrifice, take, sacrifice the, the goat, take the blood, walk in, in behind, the only time, once a year he could do this, behind the veil into the very presence of God, uh, seated in between, on his throne, in between the, whole, uh, the uh, angels. And he would sprinkle the blood of that sacrifice on the atonement cover, the mercy seat, as a way of saying that your sins are covered over. Then he would take the other goat and place his hands on on the goat as a sign of the sins of the people on the goat. And that was what we call the scapegoat, but it literally means the goat that is removed. And the idea here that's beautiful that their sins were completely, not only covered over, but they are completely removed. So they celebrate this, this day once a year. To re- it's a solemn day, but it's a beautiful day to remember that God completely covers and removes all of our sin. Beautiful. Now, the good news is this Day of Atonement points to Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. We see this language all throughout the New Testament. He's our high priest who makes atonement. Jesus is the sin offering. Jesus is the atonement cover. We see that language. Jesus is not only a sacrifice once a year. He is the once and for all sacrifice. Amen, amen, amen. And now it leads us to the most joyful of all the feasts, the seventh and final feast. Are you with me? The seventh feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Leviticus 23. On the 15th day of the seventh month, the seven is so important, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? It is a day set apart to remember specific things, and it happens when they gathered the fruit harvest. So they they weren't going to miss, the fruit harvest happens every year, at least you hope it happens every year, so you're going to remember to do this. And how did they celebrate the feast? Well, God commands them to take fruit 
from the trees, to take branch, palm branches from the palm trees, to take willows, um, to take leafy boughs from leafy trees, and, and to bring them in joyfully. And then he says that they are to dwell in booths for seven days. And the reason they're to do this is that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So, I mean, can you imagine? I I would love to go to Israel during this this time. They still celebrate this. It's so beautiful. They make make these booths. You'll see the palm branches that come, come on. What an active way to remember how God made them live in booths as they exited slavery in Egypt and became a holy nation, set apart for God. So beautiful. And it, it was a, it, God says, you shall rejoice in the feast. Why? Because the Lord, your God, will bless you and all your produce and all the works of your hands so that it will, you will be altogether joyful. In this feast, among all the other feasts, it's rejoice, 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 rejoice. Celebrate, 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 celebrate. It's a time of joy. And this time of joy, this incredible moment, points to an even greater moment of joy. The moment of Christ's birth. It's why the angels proclaim it as a time of joy when they announce his birth. That word joy is there for a reason. It's connected to the, this feast. Because in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, became flesh, and he tabernacled among us. This is, the, this is what's so amazing. God comes and he dwells among us. And that's why in Revelation, the vision of the new Jerusalem and the bride of Christ, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and and God himself will be with them as their God. God indwells his people. So this feast points to a greater indwelling, a greater tabernacling, not only through Jesus Christ, but through his Holy Spirit, God himself living with us. So those are the seven ritual feasts. These ritual feasts were given, in fact, commanded to Israel as a way to help reinforce their identity that they belong to God's family. God commanded ancient Israel to celebrate these. Now, we are not ancient Israel. We are not under the law. So how do we today apply these seven feasts in our lives? I want to talk about that. In his book, uh, The Intentional Family, sociologist William Daughtry, he highlights in this book the importance of creating rituals that are intentional and meaningful in families. And by the way, let me just say this. Not everybody even necessarily has their family around. You know, some people live all over the world here. And, and uh, some families are broken. Um, maybe your children have left the house. or You know, our families look different. The fact is, one of the great blessings of belonging to Christ is that you do have a family, regardless of whether your biological family have left or they're gone. The, the church is your family. The, this is your family. You have fathers and mothers and grandparents and sisters and brothers. And so we, even as, as a church family, do intentional rituals uh, to help bring meaning in our lives together. And listen to what uh, William Daughtry says. He says, by recognizing the ongoing value and significance of rituals, you further your identity as a family. Do you hear that? By being intentional, it helps form your identity. Rituals forms your identity as a family. You know, we already celebrate our identity in Christ as a church family. Let's take a look at it. 
You know, one of the ways that we can reinforce our identity in Christ is by annually remembering his birth, his death and resurrection, and the gift of his Holy Spirit. One way that we as a church and parent, whether you're a parent or you're being borrowed as a parent, can raise our children here. One of the ways that we can reinforce our children's identity as God's beloved child who belongs to the family of God is by intentionally celebrating the f- fulfillment of these seven feasts. For example, we celebrate a greater Passover on Monday Thursday. Jesus, our Passover lamb who saves us from death. We celebrate a greater feast of unleavened bread on Good Friday. Jesus is our unleavened bread of affliction. He says, this is my body given for you. That feast remembers the deliverance out of slavery. Jesus has a greater deliverance story, a greater exodus out of the slavery of sin. We celebrate a greater feast of first fruits on Easter Sunday. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection of the dead. We celebrate the hope of the resurrection, the gift of eternal life. We celebrate a greater feast of weeks of Pentecost on Pentecost Sunday. When, uh, when you know, Jesus, you remember the Mount, uh, on Mount Sinai, God comes like a consuming fire and descends and gives the gift of the law. And on Pentecost is a greater, a greater feast when the Holy Spirit descends like fire again and the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. We celebrate a greater feast of trumpets through the sounding of trumpets on Christmas Sunday when we anticipate God with us, dwelling with us. We celebrate a greater day of atonement on Good Friday when Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for the forgiveness, the atonement, the covering, the removal of all of our sins once and for all. And we remember that once a year. And seventh, we celebrate the greater Feast of Tabernacles on Christmas Day. God himself becomes flesh when he, t- when he dwells with us. Friends, God gave ancient Israel seven feasts to help them remember who they are. These seven feasts all point to a greater celebration in Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the gift of his Holy Spirit. They're gifts, friends. Gifts to help remind us of who we are as God's beloved children and as part and members of his family. Now, I want to make a caveat. We don't have to do these things. There's no commandment in Scripture, thou shalt celebrate Easter or thou shalt. There's no commandment there. They're gifts. These family of God rituals help reinforce our identity as God's beloved children. So, church, family, hear the good news. You really are God's beloved child. You really do belong to God's family. You are God's beloved child. It's who you are. And all God's people said...